Hey everyone, and welcome back to Damn Parenting, your English-speaking parenting podcast from Amsterdam. And as you know, we are your hosts, Maren and Eva. This week is Montessori week, so we thought, of course, why not get the rock of the town, the woman of the hour in Simone Davis, who is the author of the most cited books, The Montessori Baby, The Montessori Toddler, and her new book is coming out on uh, the beginning of March. I think it's the 5th, but we will, of course, put everything in the show notes. And we had her sit down for a chat with us, talk about Montessori. Where is it coming from? What does it mean to parent the Montessori way? What does it mean if your child wants to go to Montessori school? What are all the, the things to, to look out for and to consider and how to communicate the Montessori way? Eva and I were part of her playgroup that she runs every day from Monday to Friday, every morning. Nine if you haven't, 11 30. Exactly. There is a huge long wait list, but put your name on it if you're interested in it. It's worth it. We've been, I don't know, we went like one and a half years, two years yeah. almost. You think it's a playgroup for children, but it's also a place for you to connect and for for the parents to come. I, I was looking forward to going there every week because I knew I'm in a safe space. I can relax there and I can just connect with my child in, in a setting that I don't have to prepare. So it was, and I learned so much. How about you? Yeah, I actually really enjoyed every week she had these little pieces of paper and I go over to the little notepad and I take that piece of paper to see, okay, what's the exercise for this week? The one observe, always the hardest, take the pen and paper and just write down everything you saw. Mm. It's like, wow, my kids just flying through all these toys. One minute here, one minute here, one minute here. But um, no, it was it was a really great place. And like uh, my daughter still asks for it to this day. And obviously we had to end because playgroup is actually from, I think, 16 months to three years of age. Yeah, unfortunately, we've had our time. But honestly, it was a pure pre pleasure. And myself and Myron actually got to go on the same day. So that was also a nice thing for us to be able to yeah. catch up with each other weekly. So maybe this idea for this podcast, maybe, maybe may have sprung on one <laughs> conversation we had at the playgroup. Without further ado, let's jump into the interview and let's see what Simone has to say about what is Montessori and how do we apply it. Enjoy! And for this Montessori week, we have a super special guest and I'm so excited to announce her. We have Simone with us, who is not only the sweetest person on earth, but also an incredible author of amazing books called The Montessori Baby and Montessori at Home. And she's going to launch a third book, which is coming out at the beginning of March. And that's why we thought, let's sit her down. Let's tackle this Montessori topic, which we all have heard about, but I don't know if everyone is super familiar with it. So we thought, let's bring in the lady of the hour, Simone, who is really an institution here in Amsterdam. She runs a an amazing playgroup, Yakaranda Montessori School, which Eva and I have attended with our little ones. And we're no longer there, unfortunately, because the kids are too old. But we don't miss out on an opportunity to talk to Simone. So here she is. Without further ado, welcome, Simone. Thank you so much for having me. And it's a delight to get to come on your podcast because I know both of you from classes. So it's fun to be on behind the microphone with you today. Can you give us a little bit quick background? How did you come in touch with Montessori and how did you make this, I'd say, your like main project and how did you become Miss Montessori? That's pretty funny. Um, yeah, so I think like a lot of Montessori educators, I came to this through my own children. So Oliver is now 23 and Emma's 21. And when they were little babes, I was looking for a school for them. And I went to the open day for the Montessori um, preschool. And it was so delightful. Like we went with the whole family and the educators were so welcoming to both us and the children and so kind. They spoke in their normal voice to the kids and were really interested in what they wanted to know. And when I saw the classroom, it just looked so beautiful and attractive and had plants and artwork down at the children's height and like cozy corners for them to read and to move around and do their own thing. And I thought I would love to have played here. So it was, we put our name down on the wait list there and there was a Montessori play group on the same location. And so I started going with Oliver. He was like a year and a half 
half old. And when I walked in, I just thought, this is my place. This is how I've been trying to parent and raise Oliver, but I didn't know anyone doing it like this. And so I really learned so much from going to the classes and it really helped support me during my parenting journey. So then when I moved to Amsterdam, it wasn't long after that I like, I missed working with the parents and I'm going to start my own. Yeah, I think I just fell in love with Montessori and I just thought I would do it while the kids were small. And then, yeah, 15 years later, Jack around a trees existed and it's nearly 20 years since I've been in Montessori and I love it every mo- like I think more and more every day it just gets more and more fun so funny that you mentioned this that you came into this room you liked it like immediately because this is exactly how I felt when I went into your classroom and also when I visited my daughter's school she's also going to go to Montessori school and I had the same thing I thought can I go to school here please can I just like <laughs> roll myself and this is I think one of the core things of about Montessori that we come into this space and we see how welcoming it is for everyone. And that's really what you said. This is also what taught me with it. I was like, oh my God, this is amazing. Everyone here is welcome and everyone, everything is accessible because in a normal life, not everything is accessible for the little ones and it gets hard for them and for us then. And that also space where I, as a parent, feel so much more calm and confident because I know they are able to do stuff on their own. And that was really what, yeah, exactly your journey, what sparked your joy also sparked joy in in me and in my Montessori journey. (laughs) Yeah, it's so true. They call it the prepared environment in our Montessori training. Mm -hmm setting up the space so that it's beautiful, inviting. Dr. Montessori called her first classroom Casa de Bambini. She's Italian and it was in the early 1900s. But Casa de Bambini means house of children. And when you walk in, you immediately feel like this is set up for the children. Everything's at their height. Um, Everything's so beautiful and attractive. And Montessori, in short, if you say, what is Montessori? It's like hands-on concrete learning, you know, so the children are making discoveries with their hand. And so it doesn't need the teacher standing at the front of the classroom teaching them things. They have these beautiful materials to, to explore. And then the adults there to support and guide them as they work through the materials, see what they're working on, what they could be challenged with and what they are avoiding. And if we can come up ways to um, help them build those skills as well. When you say avoiding, like, is that like children are avoiding a specific, like they just aren't interested in going to that area or? Yeah. So mostly with children under three, if they're avoiding an area, we trust that the child's going to get to that area in their own time, but we can keep offering. So for example, say then they never want to read any books. We could say, oh, look, would you like to read this book? Or I'm going to read a bit of this book. And then you just keep offering it. You have it available for them. In older classrooms, like three to six, six to 12, when they're starting to read or math, if they were avoiding that kind of area, then it's the teacher's role to connect the child with those materials in a way that entices them and so even though every child might learn to read at a different speed like some children at four and some children at seven the children the teacher is seeing is their development in this area even if it's just a little bit of improvement so important that you say this because a lot of parents i think have a little bit of a hold back when they hear Montessori and lots of comments that I have heard was like, well, they can just do whatever they want. How are they going to read? How are they going to learn how to do math? How are they going to learn how to read and write? It's hard. They would never naturally go there. And it's so beautiful that you say, first of all, they are curious. And if you present it in a way that makes them curious and interested in it, then they will pick it up. And then of course, it's, yeah, like you said, the teacher's role. And I guess this comes then from also the whole part of having a relationship, you know, and having this eye to eye and I'm not your teacher, this is what you have to do, but I'm more like a guidance and a partner and how can I support you to want to be curious and to want to be experimenting. Absolutely. So this guide, like we don't say, we, we actually call ourselves guides more than teachers because I don't feel like I've got any more information than they do. I'm just like seeing the child in front of me and how can I help them connect with the materials in an interesting way. And the thing is, is the Montessori materials, particularly say for three to six year olds when they're learning about numbers and things are so interesting. Like people said, if I had learned maths this way, it would have been so much more understandable. So for example, when small children are learning how to do addition, they have first learned that a very very small golden bead is one and then a string of them is 10 and then a little mat of 10 strings is 100 and then 10 of those mats on top of each other make a thousand it's very hard you know in a podcast to be able to visualize maybe what that looks like but then they can see this is one and this is a thousand so they can then do sums like um 1380 
plus 4,220 because they can go and get, okay, I'll go and get one of the thousand blocks and then they'll go and get all the other thousand blocks and then they'll count them together and they can actually go, oh, there's, you know, I can't remember the numbers I said now, but say one and four, it makes five. And they actually understand why there's 5,000 at the beginning number. And like most of us just learned to write it down on a piece of paper and have to abstractly. Mm-hmm. And there's so much concrete material that helps them build those skills. And before there's even that, they learn numbers by filling the sandpaper letters and learning that this numeral means one and they're getting little beads and putting them on top of other numbers and they're playing with numbers in so many different ways in such many concrete ways that they internalize it and so sometimes the children don't even then need the materials they can just go oh the bus is coming in 10 minutes and you're like how did you work that out you know they just do it in their head after a while so it's a really beautiful way to support them naturally learn and we often don't think that children will like you said children will want to learn because it's hard but they um dr montessori identified like sense periods and that just means a period when a child is super interested in something and so I notice that when a child starts to point at letters around the classroom oh what does that say what does that say and you're like ah they're starting to get interested in reading I'm going to start playing I spy with them and then in Montessori we use phonetic sounds for letters um, instead of saying this is the letter b we say b so that then even though the English isn't particularly the 100% phonetic language. They have then got the tools to decipher and be able to break down. But uh, good. oh, it says bug. You know, eventually they'll be able to synthesize those sounds together. So yeah, I love just the idea that everything's exciting, beautiful. They make the discoveries for themselves. And um, yeah, as this guide, as your as the parent or educator, as the person in the classroom, you're seeing what your child's interested in and following those interests and trusting your child will develop. And they do, they learn to walk, didn't they? Without you mm-hmm. actually you know, moving their legs for them, they did it, you know, so they can learn all these other hard things the same way. And we can trust them, having the trust that they are able to do it and they want to do it and they want to develop and they, they want to be able to do more and more and more. I love seeing that around the house as well. Like we love to involve children in daily life activities. So you don't need any Montessori materials at home. You can just be involving them in setting the table. And there was one child in class today who'd never been to our classroom before and was making bananas with us. And you probably both remember this activity very well. We peel the banana and they peel the banana very carefully. And then they're so excited to be able to take it to the bin. And you're like, honestly, I wish I was two years old again. Blue's very excited as well for the banana activity. She's barking in the background. Yeah, basically this child has this big grin on their face. They're so pleased to be able to do it themselves and normally we think oh they're too young to be involved or then parents are worried that they're going to eat it and we're like oh well we can hold the banana on the board so that they don't put the piece in the mouth and um we have phrases like oh we're cutting the banana for our friends and so they learn that it goes into the bowl for friends and they build up the inhibitory control as well that ability to wait because we sing a song and then we eat snack together and so they learn so many skills and they love helping and being involved and Yeah. Who made the banana? Oh, I did. You know, they're really excited. One thing that I was thinking about when you were talking there was uh, there was one occasion where we're sitting down at snack time. I remember doing the smearing the crackers. My daughter, as you know, kind of would be like, yeah, yeah, I want to do this. And then it's like, no, mama. And I I would be smearing and I was kind of thinking, you know, when is she going to get into this? And so at one stage I was like, I'm going to go to the toilet, like wink, wink. And you were like, oh, okay. And as I was walking away, I think you actually said to her, this is a safe space. And I remember just stopping and I kind of turned around and I was like, I never even thought about that. I never thought like to question, does she feel safe? Is, is she happy? Is she? I just assumed. And it was like this phrase that you used. And I kind of I turned around and I looked at you and she was happily smearing. You know, I'd taken like three or four steps away and she was just then doing the activity. And it was just that's always sat in my head that now I ask her that question, that it's a case of, oh, does she feel like is she OK? Is she feeling safe in whatever situation she is in right now? And it was just something that I had never thought about when it comes to children for some reason. Yeah, that's really interesting. I don't remember specifically saying that, but I may have if she looked worried that you were leaving or like, you know, you're safe with me. Simone's here. You know, I'm here. And safety is a big part of feeling like you can actually go and explore, right? If you don't feel safe, you're not going to go and explore a new city, that kind of thing. You want to feel safe in a space. And so like when a child's starting school, a really good tip is to make sure that they know where the toilet is and where their bag is and where their lunch is and how the day is going to go because to them it feels really unpredictable. Like I'm in this completely new setting and I don't know the order of the day. And if they knew these fixed points and places, then that can give them some security and some safety in a situation that feels unsafe. It's not unsafe. And then they also learn that these are safe adults because rather than saying the word strangers, I like to just say, oh, this is someone that we think is safe. Um, So they're not learning to just go to any old person, but they will be safe with this person. And when they hear that person feels safe, they're getting that 
you know, go ahead from their parent or their caregiver. That makes them feel like, okay, yeah, my mom or dad or a person have vetted this. And that makes me feel like confident in the world around me. One of the biggest questions that I keep hearing and also have had discussions with friends is when do we start with Montessori? And because we've talked about now the toddlers and we every time we look at Montessori, we see all these children doing all this stuff. And then we think, oh, so I have to wait until the three or four and then we can do it. But actually, I think and you have a book about this whole topic, the Montessori babies. So can you give us a little insight on when is the right time to start and how do we start? Okay, well, I wanted to say it's never too early to start Montessori and it's also never too late. So if you're listening to this and your child's already five, it doesn't mean you've missed the boat. It's like, just start now <laughs> and just start small. Like, don't just change your whole house because your child might be like confused. But basically, yeah, from our training, we start from in utero and from conception um, when the baby's born and so uh, when the baby's conceived. And then you start to connect with your baby while they're growing. So your partner can put their hand on your belly and they can feel the baby moving. So you can even start observation from in utero. So what happens when we talk or we sing a song or we read a book, you know, do we feel the baby move in certain ways? Do you start to get to know their rhythm? They get to know your voices. If you've got older siblings and you're pregnant, then you can get them to also talk to the baby, read to the baby, sing songs to the baby, because all these voices become what we call points of references, similar to what we were talking about at school. And that gives the baby safety when they come out of the you know, warm, cozy womb into the world outside where everything else is very noisy. It's just like, oh, actually, I recognize that voice. I'm looking in the eyes of my parents, of my siblings, you know, um, they feel very safe and looked after and cared for. So we can start from in utero. We can start as a baby, you know, in the first weeks, you can already do Montessori. And Montessori is a baby. It looks like treating them with a lot of respect and slowing down a lot. And even in those first six weeks, we call it the symbiotic period. And they're learning to transition from in the womb to the big world outside. So so rather than, you know, scheduling a lot of visitors or making lots of plans to go out, you can actually keep it very quiet and just say, okay, this is six weeks for us to get to know you and for you to get to know us. Is that right? <laughs> Something like that. Um, and it's this bubble that you're living in. And if you have visitors, they're basically there to just support and hold you and cook for you and clean and that is kind of thing. So you can get to know each other, get sleep when you can. And um, I think it's really beautiful to just slow ourselves down and to use gentle hands when we're changing the baby. So we often think, oh, we need to change the baby so that they can, um, you know, play. But actually, when you change your baby, you can make eye contact and you can tell them what you're doing. Oh, I'm going to wipe your bottom now. And then you can wipe. And you're already starting starting these respectful practices that, you know, when a toddler, you know, doesn't want to get their jacket on, then we can say, oh, can you give me your arm? And then we can push it through together. Um, and then they can put the other arm in. And eventually when they're older, they'll be able to do a coat flip and we lay the coat on the floor and then they put their both their arms in, they flip it up over their head and they're really pleased with themselves. So it kind of goes from dependence to collaboration to then independence. And we're always just scaffolding skills, whatever skill they're learning. So for example, putting on the jacket, or it could be putting on their shoes, or it could be um, as older kids, to learn to tie their laces. That's another scaffolding skill that they're going to use at some point. Yeah. So, and if you've got a five-year-old and you've never done Montessori before, then maybe it would just be involving them more in some of the activities around the house, or it might be thinking, yeah, instead of having a big toy box, I'm going to set up our home a bit more like a Montessori classroom where we have a low shelf and just display we always say less is more in Montessori. So we might just choose six activities on the shelf. And you might think six, they're like, there's a whole day, they're going to be bored. But actually what you find is when you choose six really good activities, ones that they're really interested in, then they're likely to be more focused and get more deep concentration and put them away <laughs> because there's less things. It's like going to the Albert Heinz, the small supermarkets here versus going to one of the supermarkets in the UK or the US. You know, you can get super overwhelmed by all the choice and it takes ages. And I kind of like just going around the corner to the smallest Albert Heinz. And I've only got two muses to choose from, so I'll just just choose one of them and it makes everything much simpler. That's great. So I can also apply. Yeah, that's nice. I, I like that example with the supermarket because that's exactly how I feel. So Montessori never stop, right? It's also good for adults. <laughs> it makes things oh, easier. totally. It, it really helps for adults, I think, as well. And it's really nice to treat your partner or your grandparents in the same way as you treat the children. So often we have this phrase, teach by teaching, not by correcting. And so instead of telling the child, no, you got it wrong, we make an observation to see what they don't know yet. And then we teach it again at a neutral time. But when our partner is all of a sudden saying good job and we go, no, 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 you're not allowed to say good job. We correct them. And they just eventually like we're also killing their spirit as we correct them. So instead we can think, OK, I'm going to make a mental note. They're still saying good job. Maybe there's another article I can send them or I can send them to class to hear what Simone has to say about saying good job. You know, like there's many ways that we can build these skills in our partners as well. 
and they feel more on board than when we just tell them they're wrong all the time. Yeah, Myself and, and Marin are so laughing, by the way, because the two of us recognize <laughs> that whole good job thing because uh, we've both got family in America. And that's uh, like uh, just a like, non sequitur over there. Everyone is good job, you know, great, you know, good girl, good boy, whatever it is. And it's like, no, don't. And so when you were saying that, I was like, oh, yeah, I really have done that. Not just once, but probably repeatedly. For those people who don't know about why, do why we don't use good job in a Montessori classroom, it's because when you say good job, it's basically in extrinsic motivation you're basically saying it because you want them to do it again or to feel good about themselves but then they're basically looking to you did I do a good job and even like a four-year-old will ask you is this a good painting you know because they don't actually feel secure in themselves and what we try to encourage in Montessori instead is to encourage their intrinsic motivation to express. And so instead of saying good job when they made the orange juice or they put on their coat, we describe what they did so that they can learn what that felt like. Like, oh, you put on your coat all by yourself. You must be really pleased. And when I run this workshop called How to Talk So Kids Will Listen, we kind of say, listen to the difference. Like, I'm so proud of you, or you must be so proud of yourself. You know, it's always actually the first one's about me and the other one's about the child. Or like, oh, you're doing so well. Good job. Or, oh, look, you did it for yourself. You put the buttons all in the box by yourself and packed to put it back on the shelf for the next child. They can kind of actually realize, oh, I did that as a opposed to looking to me. So it's kind of like, it's very subtle at the beginning. And then you start to realize, oh yeah, this actually makes more sense. I'm, this is also a long-term approach. And Montessori is really about the long-term approach. And luckily I have the benefit of like having gone through, yeah, these, we call them four planes of development with my children. And I now see them in the fourth plane where their brains are still developing at university and things, but they have built a lot of skills also over the years. And I see some beautiful things come out that they've picked up over the years. And you're like, okay, this is Montessori. It makes me so proud every time I see something working. I'm like, okay, yes, there it is. There it is. It's working. We've gone through it. And now, so yeah, I, I can feel how you feel. I have a three and a half year old, but it makes me so hopeful that 20 years later, the seeds will have blossomed. I do have to say, when you were speaking there, there was a research paper in my head that I read. Um, I can't remember how long ago. And it was actually talking about when they got groups of children in. And when you applaud the outcome versus applaud the approach and the attempt, the children were more likely to only attempt to they were either only going to go because they were trying to achieve the outcome and if they weren't able to do it then they were frustrated and there was a lot of angst whereas the people who were applauded just for the attempt they were more likely to actually continue with attempting and they felt better about themselves in that way i can't remember what the name of the research paper was but yeah for some reason and that's i think only recent so it sounds like that's quite montessori then absolutely and um there's a really interesting article by uh, alfie Cohn as well which is a bit older but five reasons to stop saying good job and so that's a good one to send to a family member or something like that as well yeah okay. it's good to have some research to back up why we do what we do for sure but also there was even like um, a child today in class they're two years old they've come with their older brother as well and there was one they were by the ball tracker so this is the where you drop a ball in and it falls down a little ramp and they were happily playing with it and there was another little boy who also wanted to play with it and he threw himself on the ground he was really sad and then um the little one who was playing with the ball just looked at them really sad and took the ball and gave it to the other child and it was just so heartwarming because no one asked to do that and you know they just like there's beautiful things that happen even at two years old. They really start to want to care for the other people in their class. And yeah, it was really kind. Yeah, it's just such a yeah holistic approach also. And when you were talking that also when how can we incorporate this in our normal conversations with our partners or friends, it's really like this whole because when we hear Montessori, we think, oh, this is how children learn. This is like the method for the learning for the children. But actually, it's a whole lifestyle and it's a whole mindset of do I have a the Montessori spirit in my speech and my acting in my whole being? And can I involve my my family? Can I do something good for them? Communicate? in the Montessori way with them and then everything's going to be a little more relaxed and easy and yeah I think this is really a, a good thing to know also for people when they hear the word and like oh god this big approach and it's this huge big thing and I have to learn this and I have to buy all this stuff and I have to set it up and I have to do it right and I guess this is and then they oh is this Montessori is this right is this the right material is this the right thing to do but actually it's really connecting with yourself connecting with the people around you connecting with your children and see the daily life because daily life provides us with everything we need to do Montessori. And I think one of the key things that makes Montessori ob is observation. And I make the parents do observations in my class sometimes, which is not everyone's favorite, but it actually is teaching us to see a child in front of us. And then you 
can also do that with your partner because immediately we come up with a story like you did that because whatever and actually when you just observe it's like oh they left the door open you know it doesn't feel quite so charged so when we look at it with fresh eyes so you can practice just seeing how your child moves what hand movements they make or how they come to sit or how do they carry things and then you learn about their movement and then you could observe their language what sounds do they repeat as a baby um when do they laugh when do they cry um and then when they start to make sentences and putting two words together or how they make themselves understood because papa go is like a full sentence and it actually explains what happened you know so it's interesting to make, take note of their language and where they're developing or if even non-verbal communication when they put their hands up we know oh that means that they want me to pick them up and we do everything unconsciously but when you write it down you get to see with fresh eyes what they've developed how it was and how it's changing and i love looking at social and emotional development because in our classroom we have a lot of children under three years old and so they do a lot of parallel play but when you just focus on their social development you see them stop what they're doing watch another child and then go back to their what they're working on and that having different age groups in one space is a big part of Montessori too because the older children are modeling for the younger children and the younger children are so excited to learn from the older ones that you actually don't need to teach very much because they pick things up so easily from each other so that's also really beautiful and you can observe for the young baby how they fall asleep how they wake up and then again it doesn't have to be so activating it can just be like oh I'm really curious to make notes on what time they fell asleep today how did they fall asleep how much help do they need um, which is much less stressful than my baby's not sleeping you know we get into the big story about it or how much your child's eating you can also observe how much they eat and if they're always going to the fridge for more snacks can we set up the environment to help with the snacks so the observation helps us then adjust our environment and how we behave as well so I think that's a big part of Montessori even if you didn't have any of the Montessori materials or, or toys and it's already an activity because also one big thing is like oh what am I going to do with my child and I like, feel like an entertainer I need to provide this crafting project I need to provide this cooking project but actually observation we can practice this sitting at the table so what do we see oh we need to get on the chair how do we do this actually can we like do you want to explain this to me so it's so simple we really just need our body and that's it yeah or go for a walk with the young child like that's one of my favorite things to do too then when Oliver was really small we had a park at the end of our block and so we'd set out in the afternoon to go to the playground and usually we'd get to the playground in time for us to turn around to come home again because Because that's how long it took us and I was like I'm just going to see what he wants to stop and there was some walls that he could walk along you know at people's fences there was always cracks in the pavement and little um, flowers trying to grow out of them they'd find pine cones we just had so much fun and then the other thing we'd do each day is we went, walked across the bridge to get pick up a newspaper and walk back again and the people who own the paper store they still um, we go and visit them when we are back in Australia to say hello <laughs> because they know our kids so well that they saw them every day and so these small things it doesn't have to be entertaining them it can just be doing your daily life things um, and being curious but doing it at the child's pace instead of now we need to do this and this and this and just you know rushing through our whole life for them just these slow moments can be really beautiful or a lot of young children love transportation and here in Amsterdam it's brilliant because you have the metro and you have the tram and you have bikes and motorbikes and every type of kind of public transportation trains so that can be a whole day's thing we went to wave we stand at the station and just wave at trains you know that That was a really fun activity. We just pack a little lunchbox and sit and watch the train. So it doesn't have to be complicated things either or spending a lot of money. It's actually mostly free. I think COVID actually did us a huge favor. Well, me anyway, was we couldn't actually do anything. And so I guess I was doing that approach naturally because it's like I had nowhere to go. There was nothing open. I had, that's kind of, I guess, how we were doing it. And it was also a case of I just never wanted to rush anywhere because in my head, I think it was a fear that I was going to watch a child have a meltdown because you're like, we got to go here and the child's going to melt down. Whereas it's a case of if you go at the child's pace and predict also a little bit extra time, if you need to actually get somewhere at a certain time, you know, give yourself that time and grace basically for the child. Because if you're pushing them, you could push them to a boundary that you don't want to yeah, cross. Because I mean, that was always my fear was the whole meltdown because I've seen it in movies and TV shows and in real life and everything else. And it's one of those things that I'm petrified about. So far, so good because I just go with the pace of, of my daughter, I guess, at this stage. And you know what? Some people still 
still go at the pace of their child and they still have meltdowns. So you haven't done anything wrong. It just means that your child has maybe a stronger will or something didn't go as they expected and they got really upset. And in Montessori, we're not afraid of a child having a tantrum because that's just a normal way for a child to express themselves. And so if we can stay calm as opposed to, you know, getting angry or putting them into timeout and blaming them for getting upset, we're like, oh, you're telling me that you're really having a hard time right now. And I love Dan Siegel who wrote the whole brain shot child. He has like this diagram of a child flipping their lid and when they're having a tantrum, they can't even hear you. So if you're just saying, it was just a thing and blah, 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 and we're telling so many words, first we just have to say, yeah, you're really sad right now. Are you sad? Oh yeah, I can understand. I just breathe out with them. And, you know, um, there was once when Oliver didn't want to get dressed and he was, it was 45 minutes of like anger. And then he kind of, the next five minutes, it was kind of like a rage. And then it was a bit more like, oh, grief. And then a little bit more like embarrassment. And it just kind of went through all of these phases. And then at the end, he kind of went, okay, I'm ready. And that would kind of like sigh. And then he got dressed and I was just like, oh, he doesn't hate me for like, just not giving in to the fact that we still need to get dressed. And luckily we had 45 minutes and sometimes we will have to use our gentle hands to put down their coat and you see um, amazing Dutch parents on the bike with a child crying behind them and they're just saying yeah it's hard we're going to daycare and you didn't want to leave and you just you know you just support them as they go through their hard time and then they know that you love them even when they have have hard feelings not just that only when you like, behave well you know mm. yeah what I are think you thinking, Eva? <laughs> yeah no I was just thinking it was a case of I think sometimes when you think of Montessori it's a case of it's these people these magical people who have all the grace and the patience and the tolerance and it's a case of no actually anyone can do this because like you just said you had a 45 minute meltdown with your son okay 20 years ago or so but it was a case of like you've gone through it so like yeah. even in Montessori like everyone's children are going to go through it because at the end of the day these are children who are trying to learn emotions trying to learn regulation and everything else it's not a guarantee and if your child does melt down it's not a case of you failed it's just a case of that's part of the process yeah and also like um it's practice because as they get older they're going to miss out on getting into the school play or something's going to disappoint them and we're just there to hold space for them as they process their emotions and rather than oh don't worry we'll just cheer them up you know or say your pet dies our impulse is to kind of like okay we'll just go buy another one you know and not to let them go through the grieving process and actually children are amazing with learning about the death of you know an animal or they see the leaves change color you know things die there's a cycle of life there's beautiful books that can explain that to them as well and to sit with their grief if they have it and to for them to see us sad because sometimes we want to like okay bury our feelings and you're like no i'm actually feeling sad that um, you know grandma died yeah that was a really special person and I'm remembering, you know, you can make books for them and you can take photographs and make special albums or let them process it. You can make art for them or, you know, lots of interesting things if grief comes up. So it's also, yeah, not just these perfect children working quietly in a Montessori classroom. Montessori is also about um, helping children to process their emotions. And we have emotions. <laughs> that's really important for them to know, too. I guess that's also very important coming back also to your new book where it's about the Montessori child where you move on into to the older children and then also going to puberty where all of this then comes back to play because they don't only have tantrums when they're three but also when they're 13 mm -hmm. <laughs> they look a little different and I guess this is also this very sensitive time where it's about the connection and invite them that they come to us and ask all these questions I know they all think they know so much when they're 13 14 15 but actually they don't know so much so creating this environment and this relationship that they feel they can come and they don't get judged or corrected or whatever they might fear when we lose the connection. And I think this is then also a very good time to apply Montessori and to get into the connection with them and still teach them a lot what they need to learn, but on another level, more the emotional level and the self-development level. Yeah, it's actually really beautiful to support teenagers because they've also got a really bad reputation, just like toddlers do. But actually, you see the beauty of the toddler and how excited they are to learn and all those things. And I see the beauty of a teenager who is moving into a new phase of development where their body's again changing. So they're very hormonal and all those kind of things. They're very interested in social relationships and they're full 
of you know ups and downs you know navigating those things and again just like a toddler where they're having a hard time in the supermarket we can hold space as our child gets disappointed that someone didn't call them or include them in something and yeah it's a actually a really interesting time and they're actually really fascinating people their brains are, have really amazing ideas and they're quite activist oriented I find the teenagers today you know they really know a lot about what's going on not only in the community but in the bigger world and some of them really want to make a change sometimes it's the environment or sometimes it's something that's happening in another country and they want to really raise money or be part of something bigger than themselves and that's really important because that belonging you know we were talking about safety in a small Montessori classroom but an adolescent if you don't want them to get depressed or get anxiety some of the best ways is for them to feel like they're part of something bigger than themselves so that might be a sporting thing or it might be part of a club or something like that where they feel like they can make a difference in the world or if they're really arty and creative they might like to paint and sell their things and raise money for something that that's important to them or um, you know you might just have family who live in a place that doesn't have as much so that they send something to them and that can make them feel like they're adding and contributing and feeling like they belong so that's also really fun because it made some kids are going to get that at school and some kids are not going to have that at school so you can also support them in in any ways yeah that like you kind of said before as well it's a holistic education yeah their emotions are part of that <laughs> it's not just about academics you know what did you do your homework did you do your homework because that's often what our conversations become about and instead of that curiosity like we started with when they were toddlers just keep going like the six to twelve year old is amazing because their brain is actually has so much capacity at that time so they're actually the strongest students not when they go to high school they're okay but you know actually the six to twelve year olds are really curious about why and they're that black and white like moral issues so for example say your family go to church and another family go to synagogue and another family don't do anything they want to know those differences under six years old they kind of just go this is what we do as our family but all of a sudden between six to twelve they're like wanting to know the differences or their families are allowed lots of screen time and we don't have a TV at our house. What does that mean and why? And not that anything's wrong. It just means let's explore it. Why are, why are these things different? They wanted to kind of start exploring those black gray areas. Um, and I really like hanging out with them as well. I don't know what is my favorite age, actually. I love all of them so much. <laughs> I was just thinking, I thought the whys were only around the twos and the threes. Now you're telling me there's going to be a whole hundred <laughs> batches of whys between We're not done miles. with them. Because <laughs> uh, I'm like, half the time I'm like, okay, let's Google it. Okay, let's write that one down and I'm going to look for it later. Or But like now I'm kind of wondering what those six years are going to be about now. Yeah, it's so fun. Like in the book, we have an examples of based on their interest, here's some activities to get you started, you know, because sometimes we're at a loss. Um, and rather than Googling things, which is also a fine thing to do. It's like you say, write it down and then it becomes a project to find out what it is. Let's go to the library. Let's bring an expert that we know. Um, you want to find out about irrigation. I know nothing about irrigation, but I'm so curious to find out what we can find out. Where would we even start to find out about irrigation? And you just kind of use it as a learning path to go off and explore. Back to the library. Back to the library. Yeah. And also connection, because if they feel their interest matters and their opinions matter, then that's also a part of connection and they feel feel seen the more we talk about this the more i, I fall in love with it the yeah, more we talk about it i'm kind of like oh this is this is in daily life it's just how we choose to deal with this that's mm. the difference i guess yeah exactly you're still going through the same things but it feels a little bit easier because i think the biggest shift is that instead of fighting against our child we're on the same side as them so you're mm. like oh you want to do that and i want to do this how can we find a way that we can both have our needs met you know, you want to stay at the playground and I want to get dinner cooked. All right, maybe we can stay five minutes longer as long as you're going to help me when we get home. <laughs> you know, so you kind of find out really creative ideas. Or and as a teenager, um, like my children wanted to go to a concert and it, they were 14 and they wanted to go by themselves with a friend. And I'm like, you sound like you're ready to go to the concert. And it freaks me out that you're 14 and wanting to go by yourself to this venue. And so we had to work together to see if there was a way that would make that work. And in the end, because I didn't know the friend personally that they were going, with they came over and had pizza at our house I cycled with them to the venue I sat in a cafe where I could see them get in I told them about you know people spiking drinks and things like that and they were too scared to even have a drink <laughs> so they didn't even have anything to drink and I picked them up around 11 so they got to see the concert but they also didn't stay out too late and then they got to go to the concert and I felt as safe as I could in that situation and then there were times when we couldn't find a safe solution and I think sometimes they were actually happy that I was the person that had to say no and then they said oh mum wouldn't let me and that's okay too because I'm my it's my job to keep them safe and they know that I've explored all the options damn I wish you were my mom <laughs> <laughs> Because actually, that's an interesting question. People always say, oh, don't teenagers need to push back against something? 
And to be honest, if you're on their team, they don't need to push back on those things and they can just focus their energy on things that they love doing. And there's enough that they're fighting against and going through that they don't need to have, you know, their parents or their caregivers in an argument. They know that you're on their side. And yeah, it might feel like it's like, oh, how am I ever going to navigate that? But as you go through the younger years, it's just practice for it as they get bigger and bigger and actually have total respect for like step parents who have a 13 year old just come into their life without building any of that connection and then you start from there. I have utmost admiration because I think that's almost the hardest. You haven't built on over the years, this steady, secure, like building up that safety and connection. Yeah, over the years. But it's still possible totally to blend families. Hopefully not soon for us. (laughs) Hopefully not ever. (laughs) (laughs) It could could also happen, not through marriage, but it could be like um, a brother or sister, you know, you take their children in for Mm. some reason, you know, they have an accident or you don't know that you want that or, you know, they're busy with their work and you're just looking after an 11 year old all of a sudden you know and without actually always being their parent that can happen you know so it doesn't have to be by anything negative even yeah true I, I honestly feel like it's just a case of Montessori to me feels like someone who can be very calm and I guess that's half the time where I feel like I fail in it because it's like well I'm, I, I can't provide this calmness at all times it is the self-regulation I think that most of us parents will agree that is the most hardest thing to do as an adult and therefore trying to always think in the back of our heads the child is going through it also but they have no experience of this so they really have to you know they depend on us to be their safety net as it were but it's just that thing that I think a lot of people feel like maybe the Montessori can be like a hippie approach it could be a more of a too flexible too easygoing we joked earlier about this gentle-ish parenting myself and Myron where it's a case of like oh you just give in until it's a case of like they hit your limit and you're like right just get in let's go and then you grab the child you just march off you know you've done your best with the gentle gentle parenting but like you hit a limit I think that for me is always a case of when I try to explain like when we were going to your classes and I'm trying to explain like the reason I do it is you know, to have space for my daughter, to see her, to watch her, to see how she's changing. What is she needing as well? But it's a case of I always felt like the feedback was kind of like, oh, okay. And as we were talking about earlier, it's that thing of don't say good girl, you know, don't say, you know, well job, well done and all that kind of stuff. Because you're like, no, that, that's not how we do it. And it's like, oh, there they are again with this kind of, you know, new age stuff. And then you have to correct them to say it's not new age. It's like 100 years old. I think they're really interesting points. I think that one, an adult, is not always going to be calm and if you do lose it then that's an opportunity to apologize it's actually your children are going to learn that more from watching you apologize and taking responsibility when you got something wrong than you telling them i'll say sorry you know those kind of things so have grace and you know you can forgive yourself and also i think that's also a misunderstanding about montessori that we have no limits with the children because actually dr montessori has his phrase freedom within limits and even in our montessori classroom you're allowed to play with anything in the environment as long as someone else isn't playing with it and when you're finished you put it back when you're finished so there are some limits that make our classroom run really smoothly and sometimes you know we they find ways that they can work together that's great it's more like we don't have to set a limit then but we can just be kind and clear you really wanted to play with that it will be available soon yeah you're finding it hard you know you've seen in the classroom if the child's eating a cracker I'll say oh the cracker's for snack time I'll put it in a bowl for you so I'm still setting a kind and clear limit that yeah so it's not just letting the child do whatever they want because I think that's actually less a fair approach parenting and then being super strict is at the other end and we actually come somewhere very much in the middle which is kind of like yes let's give them a lot of freedom but there are some limits because my freedom ends where yours begins you know I don't want to take over if I hurt you that's not having freedom that's actually actually being mean to somebody you know if I hurt you so it's like yes I want you to be the most beautiful version of yourself and we live in society so there are some rules like Traffic lights, for example, if we didn't have traffic lights, it would be a lot of accidents, right? So they things to keep us safe and keep everyone safe. So times that I step in, if, if they're hurting themselves or if they're hurting the environment or they're hurting someone else, and then it's like, it's not for that. Or it might be like that they're using, they're playing with the glasses and all of the cutlery that we're going to use for snack time. And I can just say, oh, these are tools, not toys. You know, let's, um, if you want to put do some pouring with some water let's go and find a jug that's for pouring water not playing with these things here or if they're putting the potty on their head that's also a tool this a tool not a toy let's find something else that you can make a hat you know so you find what their need is and then you can actually meet that need in a way that's acceptable like if they're climbing on the table there was a kid climbing on the table today and 
normally we just say don't climb on the table but actually when you saw why they were climbing on the table they were trying to reach something on the other side of the table so then you're like oh it looks like you want to reach that can I show you how we get that by not crawling on the table so it's just translating and working out what people need and then finding a way yeah that they have freedom within these safe limits I feel like I learn something new every time I spend time with you (laughs) it's always giving me time for reflection and pause and yeah of course yeah. Are there any specific resources that you, of course, besides your own books that you find helpful for someone who had listened to this episode now and is getting curious and wants to read up a little, which is like a low approach where someone can get a feel for the whole philosophy? Yeah. So um, I think that, I mean, I ended up writing the Montessori toddler first because people kept asking, you know, what book should I read? And so I realized, oh, actually, if I just write this book, maybe it'll be helpful. And that's been really helpful. And then people wanted to know about the first year. So then we wrote the Montessori baby. And then now we've written the Montessori child, which goes from three to 12 year olds with a really 20 page chapter on adolescence as well. So that gives people an intro. And then you could go into Dr. Montessori's books and read something like The Absorbent Mind. I love the How to Talk So Kids Will Listen books by Faber Maslich about how to talk with the children. That was like my first way of going, oh, this is how you actually apply a kind and clear limit like I was talking about. And so those books are great. If you have siblings, Siblings Without Rivalry is another great book that I recommend to lots of families. I mentioned The Whole Brain Child. So if you're interested in the brain science, that's really useful as well. And then if you like the science of why Montessori works, Angeline Lillard is um, a Montessori educator and she does research and she's written a book called The Science Behind the Genius. And that goes into why it works. So that can be really good, particularly if your partner is more like the scientist kind of person, that's the book that they want to read so that they can kind of get behind it. There's also another book that's really old. It's called Montessori Madness. And it was written by a father whose child went to a Montessori school and gives you a better insight into the three to six-year-old kind of classroom. And he is actually a pilot and he compares being a pilot to working in a Montessori classroom and the differences and uh, the the similarities and things. And that was a really interesting read too, because it's from the parent's perspective. So again, another good read for like a partner or something like that to get them on board. Yeah, we're going to write up all these notes of all these books. And and that one, the last one you said there about the research or the second last one, I think I'm going to have to go and get that one myself. So (laughs) the last question I guess we will have is actually about being at home with our children. Is there certain tools as we, you would say, are there certain tools that you think would be the best things to have in the house to help the parents and the children alike in the baby stage, the toddler stage that we can actually have in the home? Yeah. So I think it's really interesting, actually, because if when people say, what do I need to buy? I often say, you don't need to buy anything. You know, you need to just go outside with them and you need to explore. Um, books are great, going to the library and reading lots of books and then maybe having a step stool so that they can reach the sink and wash their hands as toddlers. But to be more specific as well, like as babies, for example, a newborn baby, you can get something called a top Pacino, which is like a quilted cushion. And that can be really beautiful to hold the baby when they're kind of a newborn to you know, around three months, because as they're being passed around to family members or an older sibling and holding them, it kind of has less sensory input and they can also fall asleep on it. And then you can lay them down and they don't get that reflex so much. So the top of China can be a really nice thing to have for babies. Um, with babies, they lo- like the early babies, they love mobiles. So you can actually just hang some leaves and they could watch or hang them, um, put them on a blanket underneath the tree and you can watch the leaves and things like that because they're working on their visual development. And then once they start to grasp around three months, you can look at things for them to shake that make a noise um so little rattles and things like that and then once they are starting to slither and crawl you want things to encourage their movement so balls that just roll a little bit are really great so we have a big basket of balls in a baby class and they use them in many ways they can roll them backwards and forwards but they mostly like to just chase after them and then a walking wagon so not one where you sit the child in but one that they can push then they can actually get some control of like what it feels like to be a little bit moving before then they start taking their first steps Having a low shelf can be really handy even from birth so that you can display some activities really nicely on the shelf that look really attractive. And then as they get older, they'll kind of get more complicated and you'll have maybe a tray that holds all the parts. And so for toddlers, I would say a a, a low shelf with some trays could be really nice. And then, yeah, I love just including them in the kitchen activities. So we have these little spreaders from Dylan Camilla, which is a great store for Montessori baskets and for little jugs so that they can pour their own juice. Um, We make orange juice, we slice 
just bananas. And so yeah, having a little chopping board that they can manage themselves and even just a drawer in your kitchen. If you could dedicate one drawer, a sacrifice in our small kitchens in the Netherlands, I know they're very small, but if you sacrifice one drawer and then they could have like a placemat and their glasses and a bowl and all their things down there, then they can set themselves, their table themselves. And even just like having a water source. So I just had a jug on a low table so that they could serve themselves a glass of water. So you don't need a water bottle. You can just have them drinking from a glass. So we get the small glasses from um, Hamer and they're like 75 cents and they're just a small size glass for them to drink from. So there's some things to really like keep it super practical and things that you'll use for a long time and that aren't expensive at all. That would be my my tips for getting a few things for around the home. And you really did spread it across from birth right up to toddlerhood. So yeah, that was great. What do you think, by the way, about those learning towers? Um, I think they're great because they help you to have a child nearby you as you're working in the kitchen. And we don't have much space in the Netherlands in our kitchens often. So sometimes they just take up a lot of space when you're not using them or they allow them access to the kitchen when you don't actually want them all the time. So 21 or three years ago when Ola and Emma were very small toddlers, I just had um, a painting ladder and would open it up when we were using it in the kitchen and then we would fold it up and put it away and I was always nearby enough so that they couldn't fall off the side and you're always careful with big large knives or the gas or um, the stove tops and things like that that children can get close to so I think just having a step ladder is just as good and it actually even requires more control for the child you know to stand and balance so I have got a photo of Emma up there she's 14 months old Okay, because we just had a, yeah, our daughter was on the ladder because we had to fix something in the bathroom and she was just standing at the top and it was like, I can have a shower here. <laughs> she was like, well, I don't think so. Not right now. Just a two step ladder, not a really big painting this ladder. Is, but... Yeah, this is the proper big ladder that <laughs> yeah. she was on. I was like, I don't think this is a good thing for her. <laughs> just a two step. But I still have the ladder because I use it to change light bulbs and things. So it's things that you can just use, you know, a learning tower you're going to have to get rid of at some point. But I'm I'm also saying that they're also great. A trip trap chair or the similar style, I think they're also really useful for having meals together because meal times are really important in Montessori to sit down and eat with the children as opposed to putting a screen on or anything like that. Um, to actually, you're learning to show them the manners, you know, could you please pass me the bowl? You're learning how you show them how to use your knife and fork indirectly. You know, they may not be ready for a knife and fork, but they see how you eat, how you drink with your glass, how you take your plate to the kitchen when you're done, the, having simple conversations and connection. And if you do that, it, like starting from baby age all the way through, then if you're having three meals a day together, that also keeps that connection going. Like we talked about with teenagers, you know, that conversation and connection will be hold you in good stead because you don't get any cooperation without that connection. Well, I think that was a good roundhouse kick on Montessori. <laughs> what, where's it coming from? how is it applied and what do we need and I think the simple answer is not so much and let's just get started with it I guess that's the, the main takeaway thank you so so much for shedding light on this whole topic and of course explaining it also in a super simple easy way where all of us hopefully can grasp the the main idea and curious about this approach read up on it and start practicing with super simple things like everyone who listens to this episode whenever it's done you can say the first sentence and you're doing Montessori and that's that's it yeah. right yeah thank you so much for having me it's been really fun I love getting to talk about all things Montessori and um lovely to see your faces again I've missed you all Oh, thank you, thank you so you much, too. Simone. Well, best of luck for next week for your book launch. You're flying to America, I think it is. Yeah, so I go to America on the 1st of March for the book tour. And um, yeah, we're really looking forward to it and spreading a little bit more Montessori around the world. That's the plan. Will you be having one of your book signings in Amsterdam by any chance? We are going to do something, but I haven't planned a date yet. So sometime end of March or early April, we'll do a little book event in somewhere in Amsterdam. I think that could be really fun. That sounds great. Okay, so we're going to keep our eye out on your Instagram page as well. Thank Super. you. Well, uh, yeah, Simone, thank you so much. It's been an honor of being part of your class over the last uh, year and a half or so, I think it was. Myself and Myron both attending. And yeah, you've really yeah given us a lot of insight. And your books are also self-explanatory and pretty easy to read, to be honest, for anyone, for the the baby and the toddler so I'm looking forward to the child although I'm slightly terrified about what's to come with all these wives to be honest <laughs> so we'll see how it goes thank you so much until next time hopefully we'll be having you back on to then really delve into the whole child aspect sounds great thanks for having me bye everyone
And of course, as I expected it, I walk out of this interview knowing so much more and having so many revelations of how can I be a better parent? How can I connect with my child? And how easy is it to do Montessori? That was my main takeaway. And I hope also for the listeners, because when we hear this big word Montessori, we think, oh my God, we have to read up on it. Or we think, yeah, this is like where they do what they want. I don't think that's for us, but actually it is so much more. And like I said, said this whole idea of it's a way to live your life like it's a holistic approach that you can live in your actions you can live in your speaking you can live in your being really with anyone and anyone can do Montessori and it benefits everyone because it's not about a rigid routine or a rigid philosophy or only this is allowed everything is allowed within a certain framework and within a certain context and that was so beautiful how she laid it all out for yeah make it really approachable for everyone basically yeah i liked it it's freedom but with boundaries and i really yeah. like that but i did have like 50 personal questions i did want to ask her to be honest it's always like well what how would i deal with this and how would you so we um... had this situation can we be like <laughs> get a little personal <laughs> it's like dr naomi it's like hey you're on free session <laughs> no it's it's been great and i really do i have enjoyed the montessori classes and it's been a shame to ha we've had to stop with them but the reason we really wanted to make this episode wasn't just to promote Simone with her class and her books, her upcoming book coming out next week, March 5th. But also it's a case of as international families, we're living in the Netherlands. And when your child becomes four, you have to sign them up to a school. And in Amsterdam specifically, I can definitely say on this behalf, there are so many different kinds of options for schools here. You know, at the end of my road, there's a Montessori school. At the end of your road, there's a Montessori school. Montessori is quite a popular here. And then there's Dalton and Waldorf. There's so many different different options here. And so we also wanted the conversation as well to basically give parents also a semi understanding of what if they do get their child into a Montessori school, they'll have a bit of a comprehension now about what it actually is about. It's not just a place where your kids just going to run feral for the whole day, but it's going to be a case of there is education. It's just in a different approach with vertical classes. So they'll have elders that they'll be able to mod be modeled on. And, you know, there's a lot of this different thing. So, yeah, it's been great. I think, yeah, I think we need her back on. Oh, yeah, more definitely. <laughs> definitely. I just cannot wait for this book. I'm really curious to read how do we apply this with the older. I mean, she's has, she has given us some insights already, but I really want to try to keep this going. You know, yeah. like keep it going when when my child gets older and really make this a way of for her to explore the world and for her to explore herself and for her to just grow into a decent human being. And she's already already is, but to, to grow into an adult that is loving herself and is accepted and just empathetic towards other people. And I think a Montessori the Montessori approach is really something that can facilitate that yeah and a trust in yourself and believing yeah. in yourself yeah. and like that yeah. for me i think is really powerful and so looking forward to yeah reading the the montessori child as well it's from six to teenagers 12 so yeah i'm kind mm -hmm. of we've still got a bit of time <laughs> thankfully the montessori toddler i think is still in our scope i think yeah keeping that in the eyes keeping it within eye distance that we'll have we'll get there someday soon probably the blink of an eye hmm. anyway yeah and with the blink of an eye this episode is over and we slide into the last part which is every wednesday we release a expert episode on this podcast every monday at least we try every monday we release a damn chats episode where eve and i are just elaborating about a topic that has come up this week and it's our opinions and our approaches but every wednesday make sure you subscribe like and share you can find us on spotify apple podcast youtube and of course instagram if there's anything that you want us to discuss or have an expert come on please drop us a line and make sure you rate this podcast with five beautiful stars so we can be found by other parents and of course if there's anything that you want to share drop us a message or share this episode if you think this is content that someone else needs to hear and with that we'll wrap this one up another one in the books and we'll hear you next week take care <laughs>